So we're recording the call, so don't say anything that you wouldn't want anyone, you know, that listens to the, the recording later, uh, you know, to be embarrassed about. So the book today is Go Give Her Sell More by Bob Berg and John David Mann. And this is the second time that I read this. Actually, when we did the book club back during the global recession, this was one of the books that, I, that we discussed. I really, really, really like this book because it goes along, it, it, it mirrors kind of how I feel about selling, which is the more you give, you know, the more you get, I think. So not in, that's not to say that's the way it is in negotiating. But um, so, I, you know, I, I think it really kicks off on the first page where he defines selling. He says in the old, that selling comes from the old English word sell on, S-E-L-L-A-N, and he said that means to give. And, you know, it's so funny, I have my, my two interns here with me today, and one of them has been with me for three months. She's, today's her last day. And on the first day of canvassing, we walked into a space, and, you know, the person said, no, thanks, I'm not interested. And I said, okay, thank you. And I walked out, and she stopped me, and she said, you know, I learned in college that you're supposed to try to convince the people to buy. Why aren't you trying to convince the people to buy? And I said, well, keep watching and you'll see. You'll see how I do it a little bit differently. So, and I think that this book, you know, it, the whole book talks basically about that, that you're never going to convince anyone to buy. You know, you're not going to perfect your pitch so that it's so perfect that even when they walk in and they hate the space, that they're going to, you're going to change their mind for them to like it. So, um, so I, you know, that was funny, you know, for us to, to, to deal with it. Now three months later, I think she sees a whole different opinion of how selling is. It's not convincing someone to do anything. Don't you guys agree? Yeah, I mean, he, he, he goes into, and basically, I mean, what I love about this book is simply because it, it's a training manual, for, for lack of a better term. It, it's really a field guide to outside sales. And, you know, he goes through the, you, know, you don't want to deal with, pit, with a pitch, but, you know, he goes, says, you know, the salesperson's three-foot rule goes something like, anyone within three feet is worth getting to know better. And, right. you know, you, you, you want to first do no harm. And, that, and that, it really just, it, it, it was one of these books where, you know, you should be reading within your first year of out of school or if you're doing a sales job, you know, where you can, it, it just trains you to, to do things and how to really attack certain problems and certain issues that you may experience throughout any given day. Right. I, yeah, you brought up the word pitch, and how about, I, and I posted this on LinkedIn, when he says, um, you know, a pitch in baseball, the goal for a pitch in baseball is to strike someone out. And he said, I like to think about sales in terms of a serve, like in tennis. When you, do, when you send volley a serve over the net, the goal is that the person responds back, right, and engages with you. The goal is not to strike anyone out in sales, right? We don't want to strike people out. We want to serve. We want to, you know, suggest, hey, we've got this space, but let me ask you some questions because I want to make sure that my space matches what your needs are because if it doesn't, maybe I know of a space down the street that would better match your needs. But I'm not going to convince you to take a space that doesn't match what your needs are. So I love the whole serve the pitch to strike out and the serve to volley um, analogy. I thought that was great, and I didn't remember that from the first time that I read the book. So the other things that, uh, which I preach a lot, you know, I don't, I always say to people that I don't believe in closing. Like, I don't think that someone's a great closer, and I always talk about this. I think I have a video on it. I, I believe that it's all about the opening which he talks about as well, meaning, you know, those, are, those original, those initial conversations where you're learning about the prospect, qualifying the prospect, asking great questions to see, again, if your space matches their needs. And I always tell people, the better you are as an opener, meaning as a qualifier, as 
as an investigator, as someone that can get the questions answered that you need, there, then there's no need to be a good closer because you have all of the information and you know, yep, my space works, or no, my space doesn't work. And I just had a workshop, a boot camp this week with six people, and one of, four of the six people were commenting on how, you know, they would show space and the space didn't really match the needs and how much time they wasted because their properties were far away from their home office. And, I, and we talked a lot about spending the time up front to qualify so that you don't waste time because time wasters, you know, time is our commodity and we should be spending more time in the, in the upfront stage really figuring out is my space going to work for this guy or not? So Greg uh, or uh, Michelle, how much time do you guys spend in qualifying before you actually go show space? And are you guys close to your, I know Greg, you're on site, aren't you? I'm on site, yeah. So it's easy for you to, you know, and, and you can walk down, walk down the mall and, and meet people. How much, how much is, are your deals generated from your prospecting or walk-in? Uh, walk-ins anymore or mine are zero. I don't, I don't have any walk-ins anymore. When I was, when I was doing more of the, the shorter term stuff, I could do more. We had more walk-ins, but, but as the lease, the sales cycle has become longer, you know, the more, the, 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 the retailers are a little more sophisticated. They're not walking in the, in the mall office and saying, Hey, can I, can I lease space? I mean, I can't say it doesn't happen, but truly, most of it is actively canvassing or referrals or simply um, we get call, you know, we'll, we'll get some call-ins um, occasionally. But those are, those are the, you know, we're doing more of the hunting and farming kind of scenario, you know, with canvassing as opposed to um, waiting for somebody to walk in the door. All right. Michelle, how about you? Uh, for me, I would say it's more uh, prospecting, of course, um, we have, you know, probably 20, 30 different shopping centers. Um, and so definitely qualifying when a, a prospect or a tenant calls in looking for space, making sure that our different sites match their needs. And so, yes, qualifying is critical. Critical, critical. You know, and, and he talks a lot, and I agree also about how, um, you know, when you, and he talks about living with generosity and how, important it is, and, and I believe in this, you know, it's so important to, to be friends with and share information with the leasing agents around your properties because, uh, and he says, you know, a, a rising tide raises all ships. And I always say that, you know, I want, if I can't do a deal with Man Cave because it's a barber shop that sells alcohol and I have a restriction in my center that I can't bring any, in anyone that sells alcohol, I want to make, I want to try to get one of my other, you know, my other three or four neighboring leasing agents to know about this prospect because if they can lease to them, that's one less vacancy off the market that helps all of us, right? The, the least amount of vacancy in your primary market, the higher your rents are. Do you guys feel like, now I don't know if maybe that's different, Greg, in the mall business, but I don't think it is in, in the shopping center business at all. But it's definitely good business. It's a great practice. Right. And you, are you guys familiar with my um, dead deal meetings that we do down here? I am not. So twice a year, we, the, the neighborhood leasing agents around our properties, we get together and we each bring two dead deals, deals we couldn't make. So we go and have coffee for about 45 minutes to an hour, real quick. And the four leasing agents, again, we're all like within, you know, a couple blocks from each other. We are all required, you know, or encouraged to bring two dead deals. So two prospects that we couldn't make deals with, whether it was rent related, whether it was a timing thing, financials, uh, you know, uh, frontage size. You know, lack of TI, one landlord doesn't give TI, one landlord does. And we sit down and we go, each person says, okay, here are the two deals I couldn't make in the last six months. 
And a lot of times someone walks out of that meeting, another landlord rep, thinking that he can go make that deal because he's got more TI or he just had a new vacancy that came up that might match the guy's needs. So you guys, if, you're, if you have good relationships with your neighboring leasing agents, or, or frankly, this would help make those relationships good by offering, you know, by having a, a little dead deal meeting over coffee. You know, That's a you, fun idea. Yeah, so much fun. And Greg, do you got? Do you have malls? Do you have other malls in the same, you know, in your community that you could uh, meet with your counterparts at two other malls in your area? Yeah, we we've done dead deal meeting. I mean, we call them, you know, seasonal lunches or however you know you can insert the term here. But we've we've done those in the past, and they've, you know, they 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 were good to start, but then they kind of. You, it, it helps to have a very pointed agenda, and I think if, like, for what you're doing is if you have a couple people, you know, a couple deals you brought to the table, and everybody else does the same thing, you can focus and 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 tailor that meeting towards what those specific retailers and see if you can't help each other out. I think that's beneficial. We just we got off on a tangent; it gets to be kind of a bitch session over retailers. It's like this isn't helping anybody. So yeah, for sure. No, yeah, yeah. Well, so ours are. We're very pointed, you know. I'm very, you know. Let's let's, you know, let's try to get in and out of here in 45 minutes. Yeah. Everyone bring two deals, you know. Sit down, talk about them, and let's go. You yeah. know, and I and, and you know, sometimes they, people go off on tangents, but you know, it's really all about let's try to get let's try to learn about some other prospects that were in our market looking at vacancy. Obviously, that's real. That's someone that's interested. And for, in my case, I couldn't make a deal with them. Maybe one of the three of you can. So he talks a lot, obviously, in Chapter 1 about creating value. And it said, he says, um, the value that you are able to produce definitely uh, equals how much money you're able to make. And I think that that is so true. Um, and I think that at all times, you know, whether it's the beginning, in the beginning of the day, we should be saying, you know, my goal today is to, to add value to the people's lives that I come into contact with. And then at, at the end of the day, say, how did I create value for the people that I came, in, 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 came to touch today, right? So and it's and, and it's hard because sometimes when you're when you're an adversary right on the other side of a negotiation, how do you add value, right? Because you're supposed to be working as a fiduciary for your owner. So what are some ways that you guys think that we can add value as leasing agents that maybe we haven't thought about before? What, one way that I add value and actually to try to and I think add the the term value. I think needs to be a, a definite defined understanding because everybody has a, its own thought process of what value is. But I, I always try to either send a, a photo of something that I've seen or send an article relating to their business or just ask or a podcast or something that I may think may benefit them in the future. And I'm not saying it's to, to persuade them to leave the space. I'm, more or less sending them a note saying, look, I care about you guys. I saw this, and I thought this might be a benefit to you. You know, happy to discuss, you know, anything, happy to discuss the concept or that kind of thing, and I leave it at that. And I try to send a related article to five or six people that I see, um, you know, to, to more or less just in keep a conversation or get some engagement going because, you know, time kills all deals, and if you're not connecting with a prospect or a customer, the deal's never going to happen. So it just keeps them in front of top of mind. You know, that's a good idea. Like, so I do that when I have, like, a prospect that I haven't been able to make a deal with, but not necessarily someone I'm in negotiations with. Because, you know, like, so I always say I want to, you know, touch someone, you know, have five touches on people that I'm trying to do business with. But that's, a, that's kind of an interesting take that, like, while you're in the middle of a negotiation with someone, also have that plan because yep. I'm sure it will help when the negotiations get a little sticky 
have them have a smile on their face because, you know, you sent the podcast idea or you sent the article idea. So I, I don't do that, Greg, while I'm in the negotiations. I kind of feel like, oh, you know, I, I nagged them or I gave them five touches. Now I'm doing business with them, and then I stop doing those touches. So that's a really good idea to keep doing it even while you're negotiating. Yeah, I don't, and I don't, it, it's with it's and it's with retailers that we currently have. It's ones that I would really want to have, and it's ones that we're currently negotiating with. So I, I don't really um, segregate okay, between the two. It just just I send it out if it looks good to send it to send it to them, and you know usually that keeps some engagement going. Not everybody responds, but you know that's not the goal. I don't I'm, I, I I truly want them to read it and get an understanding of why I sent it to them. And I think that's, the be- that's truly the, the benefit, and, and that's the objective of why I did it. So let me ask you this. Do you, so I do a lot of that when I come across things. So, for example, the other day I came across uh, a, an email that was like, um, what's the word, like a clearinghouse for podcasts that are looking for speakers. <laughs> So I scrolled down the podcasts that were looking for speakers, and I found like five that I sent to people saying, hey, this guy's looking for a speaker in this realm. You know, I, you know, I think you'd be a good, you know, a good guest. So it came to me. I reviewed it and thought, oh, these five people could benefit. So my question to you is, do you, are you a reactor? Like, do you come across an article and think, oh, so-and-so would enjoy this? Or do you show up every day and say, I want to find, I want to be proactive and find an article that I can specifically send out to a group of people? The majority are reactive, so that's probably 70-30. But, I mean, I, I will say that there are if, – if it's a prospect that I'm trying to persuade one way or the other, right. Right. I, I will seek out information to show, them, uh, to, to show them the value of having a conversation with me and how we can benefit them. And, right. it will go, and it will involve business planning. It will involve marketing. It will involve, you know, whatever it is. Um, <laughs> I, I, I tend to – you know, for me, photos – really share and, and, and tell a story a lot better than words do because most people are going to look at it on their phone and they're going to see the picture and be like, oh, that's great, as opposed to reading an article. So right. I will seek out different pictures of kiosks or fun stores or pop-ups or whatever the case may be and send it to them and say, hey, you know what, I thought about that. I saw this. And I'm like, you know what, I think, it's a great, I think this is something you probably want to, want to consider going forward. Exactly. Okay, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, you know, and he talks a lot in this book about how and I, I just was speaking to someone this morning. I don't know if you guys know Gary Rappaport with the Rappaport companies in Washington, D.C. He um, has been an ICSE trustee. He wrote a book on how to invest in shopping centers that's phenomenal. And he's just a very giving guy. And uh, his president, Henry Fonville, who's the head of his leasing team, and I were on the phone this morning, and he said, oh, I saw that you're doing the Go-Givers book today. And I said, yeah. And he goes, I'm not going to be able to be on the call live, but I'll definitely listen to the recording. He said, you know, I said, I know what you're going to say. And he says, what? I go, Gary, which, who's his, like, the leader of his company or the, founding, the founder of his company, is the epitome of the Go-Giver. And he goes, you know, Gary, he goes, I don't know how he dis- does it, but he gives and gives and gives and gives with never, ever an expectation or a, or a tally, like a tally chart of I gave and then want to, and give to get something in return, right? And, and Gary Vaynerchuk talks about that all the time. You know, he says, you know, he gives him, he goes, the minute that you give, you know, the minute that you give free content, free content with the expectation that you want someone to buy your book, then you're dead in the water. Like you just have to give and give and give and give, and if and, and if no one ever reciprocates, that's okay too. And and Gary Gary Rappaport, it's so funny they're both named Gary. Gary Rappaport and Gary Vaynerchuk, I think, are are two really really solid representatives of that concept. Well, it's how you build trust. 
You know, I mean, it's how you get someone to trust you. And I mean, if you're only sending it, you know, once every six months, then, then you know, perhaps you know your concept or whoever you're talking to is going to look at you. You probably have an ulterior motive. But if you're continuing to give and you're continuing to share value and you're just sending everything that you can to them to, to really looking out for them, they will eventually trust you, and they're going to look at you as as a as a cons- cons- much more as a consultative partner and a trusted advisor as opposed to someone who's trying to sell me a, sell me a shopping center space. Exactly. That's so true. Yeah, he says on page 25, stop, stop keeping score. You know, don't do it to keep score. Um, I also like the concept in the book, I don't know where, where it is, where, and I thought that, I had never thought about this either. You know, so, we, so today, you know, we talk about how connections is the new um, commerce, right? It's the, it's the new, I don't think commerce is the right word, connections are the new... I think maybe commerce, but anyway, it's the new way to it's it's the new way of doing things. Even though we're all in our phones and on our laptops and on our iPads, connections are never going away. That, I just read somewhere that events, you know, the the plan, the number of events planned in 2020 is up like 30 percent because people are realizing that human connection is you know, we need to get back to that because we've been so focused on technology over the next, last 10 years. So um, I forgot my train of thought. Oh, so in the book somewhere, I'm not sure where, he talks about how every person you meet, you are connecting with their sphere of estimated 250 people. Did you read that? Did you guys see that? I mean, I, I thought that was, so he goes, if you meet 10 new people at a conference, there is a potential that you've just, you know, added a potential of 2,500 new people in your, in, you know, that you could potentially be connected to through this person. I thought that was wild. Michelle, what do you think about that? Um, I agree. In fact, much of, well, stepping back a second to much of the different ways that you all are kind of giving touch points, uh, I'm a huge fan of that, not just to prospecting and prospects, um, but just to people in our community in general, associates in my office, associates outside of my office, whether that's, you know, sharing a new market opportunity or, you know, just randomly sharing some um, rent comps or some sales volumes that I maybe learned. Um, I just think sharing of that information always seems to, to, to come back to, to one. Um, you know, again, sharing a prospect that I wasn't able to, to accommodate, you know, with a broker of a nearby center, those sorts of things that, you know, the, the team here has talked about. Um, and then, um, yeah, as far as, you know, connecting in person again, um, I think there's huge value, value to that. I've, I fell into the hole of, you know, just contacting by email and getting so busy that we just, you know, we don't have time for the different events anymore. Or, um, you know, giving of our time or being on board. So, uh, you know, one of the reasons I'm on this call, for example, is just to, you know, take a step forward and um, taking action, you know, progress over perfection in, in meeting more people and talking on the phone with more people and growing relationships. And um, I think that that's going to be really helpful with things, um, even, you know, as basic as Retail Live. I can, I, I certainly plan to attend a few more of those events myself, so that makes sense. Uh, yeah. That so, it's on the rise. Uh, yeah, that, that w- I hope I get to meet with you, meet you next week. Um, we, I did a LinkedIn post a couple weeks ago and t- asked people to, you know, how do you get most of your leads? And a huge majority had mentioned conferences. And, of course, I think we know I see, and I said, besides ICSE, what other conferences? And people had listed, you know, the Franchise Conference, Retail Live, CCIM, so Chambers of Commerce, so I thought that was great. Uh, on page 30, I kind of I talked about this before, um, where, and, I, and I also did, I, when I read this, I think I posted something maybe on Instagram, that money is an, this is a quote of his, money is an echo of value. And I thought that was so powerful. Money is an echo of value. So again, focusing on the value you're providing, and, and money will be an echo of that. And um, I just, I think, you know, one of the things I think that, and it's... I'm like, sorry I'm late. 
Are we talking about the law of, of attraction? We're talking about go givers sell more. Right, yeah, I, I read that. Yeah. So we're I talking want, about I'm sorry I'm late. I didn't an know echo of value. But I, I think one of the things that that is very valuable, which is not done often in our industry, I'm sure not with anyone on the phone call here, but return phone calls, right? Follow up phone calls. You know, my my interns who were working on market studies were just astounded, these 21-year-olds, astounded that leasing agents would not be turn, returning phone calls. And I think that that's a huge valuable action that all leasing agents could employ that many, unfortunately, do not. Thoughts? Because we all return our phone calls, right? I used to have a rule at Terranova, if you didn't return your phone calls, you'd be fired if you didn't return your phone calls within 24 hours. Because that was just That's amazing. fantastic. I'd that was one of my biggest people. pet peeves. If someone called me because my leasing agent didn't call someone back, they would be in big hot water. Big hot water. Oh, and there's okay. no reason not to call somebody back. I mean, if they're calling you, they're, they're an active and engaged it, you know, prospect, and you know, if you're just going to ignore them, what does that say? That just that just says, what does that tell about you in general, as a, as just as a salesperson or as a person? You know, you're you're focused on, you're not trying to give back. You know, if someone's trying to ask you for information, the first thing you, you should be responding immediately. I mean, I, exactly. I don't, exactly, and I, I mean, I know, I do know that there are leasing agents that have 20, 30, 40 properties. I mean, like Michelle just said, she has 20 or 30 listings. So I'm sure that sometimes if she, you know, if you're getting 20, 30, 40 calls, like one call a day per listing, you know, maybe that goes into the next day. But in my mind, you know, wake up, you know, wake up or start your day 30 minutes early just to make sure you're responding or returning any phone calls that you got the day before before your day gets going, you know, to respond. I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't understand, you know. And, I, and again, um, I would say as to the leasing director, if you have a leasing agent that has 50 assets and they can't return their phone calls, then you need another leasing agent or two. Right. Right? right? Because and, and, and or at least a better support staff. Yeah, right. or to delegate. Mm-hmm. Right. So that so that the twenty vape vape store calls can get returned by an admin, especially if the owner of your properties would never do a vape store, and then we could just politely have an admin call back and say, "We're so sorry, we're that's not a use that we're going to be doing." Right. Um, a lot of vape talk- store calls. <laughs> yeah, a lot of them, right? Probably fifty to sixty percent. That and cannabis, pretty high right now. Yeah. Are you guys doing cannabis stores? You know, we um, hadn't in the last year or so, um, and we represent quite a few. You know, we're developers, and so we develop power centers and grocer um, anchored properties and a lot of mixed-use development, but then we also do third party. And, you know, I've seen somewhat of a pivot in, you know, starting about four or five months ago where even the REITs, depending on the group, the financials, the number of locations, et cetera, are willing um, to do those leases. And so I haven't done one yet, but I've certainly um, even what handled state are you LOI. In? Austin, Texas. Really? Texas? Mm-hmm. When did, te- when did Texas decriminalize? Or is it medical or is it recreational? It's CBD. It's not, it's not actual cannabis. It's CBD stuff. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in Florida, in Florida, if you have a mortgage, um, you can't do a dispensary. And I have a, a center that I had a, a an LOI with a six thousand square foot space, and they were offering ten dollars more a square foot than I was asking, or you know what my rent was. And I normally wouldn't have done it, but I, you know. I was struggling at this potential, at this, uh, at this specific property with vacancy, 
so I thought, well, you know, I guess I'll, I'll uh, you know, lower my values and, and go ahead and consider doing this deal. But I had a casual mail, DXL, and I looked at their lease, and it said, no head shop. So I felt the need to call casual mail up and say, define head shop. And they said uh, anything with CBD or cannabis or, you know, whatever. And they said, look, we understand that in the next two or three years things are going to change, but mm -hmm. we don't want to be pioneers. Right. So uh, I did not move forward with that deal. So, um, so in that case, but I just heard you know, I had a couple, I had a Philip Edison agent at my boot camp two days ago, and he said that they're doing uh, CBD deals left and right. So, and, and we know Simon is as well. Right. So yep. it is coming for sure. I think the change is coming. Yeah, so I would agree the, with you. Yeah. The other quote that I loved in the book was, your compensation is not a reflection of your goodness, your worthiness, your merit, or your industriousness. This industriousness. It is an echo of impact. And that, which I loved, the echo of impact. And, you know, if you touch, your goal is to touch as many lives as possible with that added value. Your compensation is directly proportional to how many lives you touch. And, and they, they say you, your job is to continually find more people to meet, building your pipeline, and adding substance, which is personal impact, to those people, which is why uh, conferences are so great, because you get to meet, you know, but, but a lot of times, you know, and I, I, yesterday when Barry Wolf and I did our webinar, afterwards we did a little video, and we started talking about the Florida conference, which is coming up in a couple weeks, and I said, so how many meetings do you have? Because he always has so many meetings. He goes, oh, my gosh, I have meetings every 15 minutes. I said, great, and here's my question. He goes, oh, no, I know this question's coming. How many new people are you meeting with? And he goes, mm -hmm. don't ask me that. I said, yes, because you're meeting with the same people you already know. He goes, I actually, I have three meetings with people I don't know. So, you know, our job when we attend these conferences, for sure, are to meet people we don't already know, right? Right. But it's very easy, and we get kind of complacent and kind of lazy by just setting up appointments with people that we already know, which, which I challenge everyone on the call, and I see the list of people on the call that are not speaking up, and I love all of you, and that's okay that you're not speaking up, but most of the people on the call are going to the Orlando conference in two weeks or ten days, whenever it is. And I'm, I'm, incur I'm, I'm suggesting, encouraging, begging all of us to pay a little attention to this and say, okay, that's right, I need to meet some new people. You know, who can I reach out to that I, would, that I don't know and would like to know to meet so, so you can add to that sphere of influence that potential new 250 people, right? The 250 people that those people know. Right, Greg? I would agree, even though I'm not going to be at the Orlando conference. But what? No, I won't be. I'll be at Retail Live. I won't be at the Orlando conference. Right. Yeah, you're going to be at Retail Live. Are you? Do you have appointments set up for Retail Live? Um, no, I don't. <laughs> Okay, I want, I'm going to challenge you to, to set up two appointments with people you don't know. Will you do that? Challenge accepted. All right. And, you're, and we're going to meet. And you, we, we've never met in person, but we know each other. Yeah. Okay. Other, as, I'm, as I am turning the pages of the book, what, for those of you that, um, you know, feel free to jump in if you haven't jumped in already. He, the, the, one of the chapters in the book, he talks about rapport. And he says, the classic sales formula for rapport building conversation is the acronym FORM, which stands for family, 
occupation, recreation, and message. And he says that, that when you're meeting someone at a conference or, you know, or let's say it's a prospect you're showing space to, these are the four areas that you can have, try to get some topics of conversation going to try to create some common interest. Right, family, you know, do you have kids? What are your kids into? Occupation, you know, that, well, that would be easy for us. Recreation, you know, what do you like to do? Oh, you like to skydive? Oh, I skydive, you know. And then um, message, I don't know what that means really, message, what their message is. I guess, I don't know. What do you guys think that means, message? Message. Like what their mission in life is? I and mean, I, when I read that, I wasn't sure what that was. But I do think that, you know, it's, it's and, and then he talks about how when you're meeting someone and, and, and someone says, oh, well, my, I'm so proud of my son because he just, you know, made the honor roll, that it's very important for us, the people in the selling side of the business, that we don't try to one-up them. Oh, well, my son was the valedictorian. Like, that's the worst thing that you can do, Right. So, um, and he talks a lot about that, that that happens a lot, that people try to one-up the others. And I think hopefully we all know in sales that that's a truly a way to lose any interest from a prospect by, you know, either making them wrong or trying to make them feel bad. And, you know, it's, and I see it happen all the time, and I'm, I'm looking at the person saying, well, why, are you, why are you making this guy feel bad? We're trying to get them to buy from us. Right? Have you guys seen that? I used to see some bosses, of, my old bosses do that, which is just terrible. Uh, going through uh, the skills, there's a, there's a whole chapter on skills, and they talk about, you know, don't be me focused. You know, you need to be you focused. I don't know if you guys saw in Vegas, I was running around with buttons that said no email blast. I want to change them to say no email blast because they're all about you. But it says uh, listening to a person, the person, and responding genuinely is far more effective than trying to guide the conversation through a pre-planned pattern. And I see that a lot where new people in sales think that, okay, I have these 14 questions that I need to ask the prospect. And as you're asking the question, you're not listening to the answer. And, you know, I read so in, in another book once where it said the salesperson's definition of a good listener is waiting for the prospect to stop talking so you can, so you can speak next, which is, you know, exactly what happens a lot of the time. So just staying very present and asking a question that you want the answer to and listening to the answer so it doesn't look like you're just going through the motions and then at the end you don't remember what they said about, you know, what, where are they going to get their capital to open their store. And I know it's hard in the beginning because you, know, you, you don't want to walk away and say, oh my gosh, I forgot to ask these three questions, which what I used to do is I just used to have the questions on my pad so it would remind me to ask them and I, I'd rather be thorough and have a cheat sheet than to forget or not be present. Do you guys have any tips on that? I mean, some of us have been in the business, I think, a long time where we just have those questions. We know the questions we have to ask. But is anyone on the call new, and do you guys, you know, do you guys have the sheet in front of you of the questions you want to ask prospects, or what are your tips and tricks? It depends if I'm landlord wrapping or tenant wrapping. Okay. So tell me, uh, tell me the Landlord wrapping. I, I get right down to business plan and uh, use. How often Usually, does a person have a business plan? Uh, four out of ten times. Right. So what do you? So when they don't, do you just say, "Call me when you have one"? No, I try to coach them through one, at least one that looks like the landlord's not gonna just reject it outright. Mm -hmm. Um. And then I ask, for, I ask them to assemble a team, be it contractors, be it attorneys, be it uh, anybody, and 
it depends on how fast that happens. And I give them like a handful of days. Well, that's very nice of you. Of the ones that you coach through, how many get? How many landlords approve of the deal? Uh, I'd say in the last year, I'd say maybe three or four out of maybe a hundred. <laughs> oh my gosh! So I would say to you then, is that worth your time? Three out of a hundred. Well, you know, I, I my market tends to be have a lot of velocity in people that are, for lack of a better word, marginalized. Mm-hmm. And some of them come to this country with a dollar and a dream and they want to do something, but they don't know how to do it. And, I, you know, I, I, when I request banks and bank management and bank statements, that, that says a lot. Right. You know, I can't... And, and my landlord is going to want to know who they're getting into bed with for the next handful of years. So we might as well get it out of the way first instead of last. For sure. Maybe what you could do is um, what about creating some sort of, not like for lack of a better word, training form or like training wheels, like you put together a one-pager with bullet points, and when, the, when, the, when those 100 people say, I don't have a business, car, business plan, you can say, well, no problem. I've got a little helpful cheat sheet. Let me send it to you. Oh, I do. I have one of those. It's called the roadmap. Okay. This and then that way you don't spend go- your time when right. only three out of a hundred, you know, filter through and make it. You know, then right. then send that out, and then those of those that then take the time to read it and go to the next step, call you, and you're like, okay, these people are worth my time. So you're still well, helping. You're still helping those people, but you're also getting some time back. Right, and that's exactly what I'm trying to do: is help people achieve their dreams, but protect my landlord at the same time, and hopefully get paid at the end of it. Right, and and what I'm saying to you is, I want you to protect your time, your time. So I love that you right. want to protect your landlord, and I love that you want to help the people, but. We could spin a lot of wheels helping the people and protecting the landlord when your, your time is the most valuable thing in all of that. Do you follow? Oh, I do, absolutely. Um, so the other thing that I loved here in this book was um, okay. 99% of what looks like listening in the world is not genuine listening. It's just waiting at the stoplight with the mind's engine running until the light turns green and we can go again. (laughs) I'm sorry, but I have to go now. Uh, I appreciate all this. Go ahead. And I will will catch up with you guys on the next call. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend, everybody. And enjoy the, the, the waning days of summer. See you later. Bye-bye. So, um, so he says, with the mind's engine running until the light turns green and we can go again. When you listen, put in a neutral. Even better, put it in park and shut off the engine. Just listen. Genuine listening is rare. In order to get, he goes, most people describe listening, uh, would describe as listening in order to. In order to what? in order to get to the end of their sentence so that I can make my point. Great salespeople don't listen in order to do anything. They listen to learn. They just simply listen. I just love that because I think that that's such a big problem in our world. Thoughts on that? Uh, So so often in conversations, you're you're simply, like you said, you're, you're, you're trying to get your point across. And... You know, nobody cares, and, and what's, what's always been told is that nobody cares what you think or what you have to say. Simply, your, your objective is to learn more about the person that you're engaging with and to find out how you can help them as part within the conversation. That's just normal. It's just a, a, a conversation technique. And but, you, but you know, Greg, do you know how many people call me and say, or email me or put a note on LinkedIn and they say, Beth, can I talk to you because I need 
uh, I need some help with my pitch. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm sure you get it. I mean, you probably get seven a day. I mean, and I go, well, the first thing's first. If you're, you're working on a pitch, you're in trouble from, from, from the get-go. We don't want to talk about pitches. And that was before I knew, knew about the pitch leads to a strikeout. And, and, you know, the, the more the, the conversation just needs to be focused on the person that you're speaking with, not it has nothing to do about you. Nobody cares about you. The person that you're talking with doesn't care about you. They want to know why you're, you know, how you can help them. And if you're too busy yapping, you're not helping them. They're just, they've shut down. Now, do, do any of you guys have a problem? I feel like I have a problem because I come across as a, like a private investigator. And, and not only this book, but there's been other books that have, have cautioned against that. I'm like a drill sergeant, like, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And I try to be less direct and more conversational. But I want to, you know, because time is my commodity, I kind of want to get all the answers to all my questions. And I don't want to come across as like a, as like a, you know, a private detective. Any thoughts on that from you guys? Aaron, I know you're on the phone. What do you, you haven't spoken up. Spoken up about what specifically? Have you, so I have a problem sometimes when I'm talking to a prospect and I'm asking them a lot of questions, which is what this, all this book is about is asking questions. You know, I sometimes come across as like a detective and more drilling than conversational. And I don't mean to do that, but I just want to get the answers to my questions so that I can either help them or not or move on. Yeah, I, I, I don't so – so I guess your problem, what you're saying, is that people have gotten uh, opposed to you asking too many questions? Or, yeah, or, like, or, or I'll be with someone and someone will say, gosh, you're, 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 you sound like you're a drill sergeant or like uh, – you're like a detective. And well, I, you, you are. Know, well, I know. So I try to be more conversational and put in, you know, more like family or, or like football or some other things into the conversation. But, you know, I'd like to just get in, ask the 13 questions and say, okay, I've got space for you or not. But I was just wondering if any of you on the call have ever felt like you were being more direct and less friendly, certainly I don't think that being less friendly is the way to win friends and influence people. Uh, so, Beth, this, on that this is, so this is Michelle Gary, and I think I'm the same, you know, and again, all we have is our time, and so we naturally tend to move pretty quickly and try to be direct and get those answers, but I've found over the years, and what I continue to try to hone, is the more time you take calmly up front in any meeting, whether you're at a convention or you're on a call or you're about to go over a letter of intent, that initial stage of bonding relative to nothing related to the business or the deal, but just about them and where they're from, from a genuine place, two or three minutes of that pay, you know, it just, it just it saves time in the long run and it's very helpful. And it is about making the relationships. It's not just about the deal. Having that bond and that relationship and showing that to the prospect is a game changer in doing deals. At the end of the day, it's business, and each party has to have certain economics and, and check off certain boxes, but I guarantee you if there are two spaces that they have equal interest in, and this is from a landlord-tenant perspective, and there's two separate meetings, and one of the brokers or landlords take the time to engage in that way for the first minute or two, their connection to that group will help and likely result in leasing that space, even if you are a couple dollars off, because it's also representing a long-term relationship. And when things get tough again, you know, it's just it's not going to be, you know, head to head and horn to horn. It's coming from a place of kind of how, you know, acquaintances work with each other, not strangers. And so um, I think it's more beneficial to be less direct, even though, time, you know, pressures us and our desire to get all the answers pressures us, I think it truly pays off to take that couple of minutes up front just to establish a relationship and get to know each other. Yeah, and, and, and you know, the, the, the basic Tom Hopkins, people do business that, with people that they like and trust, right? And they're not yeah. going to like and then it's, trust you. you don't and then it's repetitive and then more conforming. And they're also willing to share more 
right? You want to open up or you're willing to open up with people that you're more comfortable with and you're sitting back in your chair instead of being so uptight because that first few minutes really set the tone for the next 30. Right, right, right. Then later on in the book they talk about, thank you for that, Michelle. Later on they talk about objections. Which, and, you know, it says the truth about objections is that most of the time they aren't really objections, right? Uh, And I I am a huge believer of this. I believe that people don't want to buy fast. They need to come up with ways to delay because no one's going to walk into the space or walk up to the kiosk, you know, and say, okay, I love it. I want to take it. Where's my lease? Like that never happens. And they may feel like they love it, but they can't. That, you know, everything in the, every cell of their being, of their body says, no matter how much I love it, I can't tell them I love it. I have to come up with some objections. And that objections are really, really, most of the time, not, objection, not object, objections. They're just slowing up the process. And he talks about um, when the conversation, you know, comes up to an objection, turn in the direction of the skid. And he, for those of you that drive, you know, in icy climates, they say, you know, it, it goes against your grain that when you hit ice, you think that you want to overcorrect and go the other way. But in essence, in, in reality, the only way to slow up the skid on the ice is to go in the direction of the ice of, or go into the direction of the skid. And when that someone says, well, you don't have enough, there's not enough traffic here, you know, you're right, we don't have a lot of traffic or exposure or you don't have enough parking. You know, I like to always agree with them. I don't want to make them wrong. I don't want to argue with them because a lot of the times, you know, or your rent is too high. Yep, my rent is very high. Definitely, are you, you know, where else are you looking? Are you only looking in this submarket? Because, you know, trying to understand where their objection is coming from. But, but most of the time I find that objections are not really objections. They're just trying to slow up the process. What do you guys think? No thoughts? Did I lose everybody? I think there can be some of that, um, you know, for different reasons. People are slowing the negotiations or slowing the timelines or maybe looking at multiple properties and not willing to commit. Um, but I think that there are times that the objections that are presented are legitimate ones that we have to talk through. But I'd say that's 50-50 for me in my experience. Awesome. Yeah. Um, let's see. It is, oh, my goodness, it's 1224 already. I'm, let's see if there's any last. Did you guys like this book? Like I said, I loved it. I, I think it could be, this, this should be a training manual for, like, new leasing reps, new salespeople, simply because it, it just covers the very high-level stuff, but it does get into the weeds a little bit on certain subjects. Mm-hmm. So this combined with, you know, a couple other books I think that are out there, I, I, it's just for someone that's new, just, just even getting into sales, whether you've, you've had a 20-year career or a two-year career, I, I think it's a good read and it's quick. It's not long. It's not a battery. It's not a terribly long book. So I think it's a good yeah. treatment. Pretty, yeah, and, and, and at the end of the book, he talks about how, you know, early on in sales, you tend to talk too much. You know, th- you show up and, you know, what I always say, don't show up and throw up because a lot of times people in sales in the beginning think my, go- my job is to, for, to tell the prospect the 42 reasons why they should be leasing my space where, um, you know, the more experienced you are, the more confident you are, you know that that's not the case at all. And and he writes, the most important words that will ever pass between you and your prospective customers are the words spoken by them, not by you, right? If you're talking, you're not learning. And I I just think that's crucial in sales. So so thank you guys for joining. Um, The next book is on September 20th. It's called The Fred Factor, and actually... Uh, Fred with Phillips Edison out in, in Park City is the one he gave me a copy of that book, and then I happened to meet the author. I'm trying to get the author on the call. That will be fun. So September 20th, The Fred Factor. And for those of you, I, Michelle, I hope I get to see you next week in Austin. Greg, I'm excited to see you. Any of you guys that are going to be going to Orlando, I'll see you a few days after that. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your summer, and thanks for joining us. 
Thanks, Beth. Bye.